Our afternoon keynotes for today, our afternoon keynote for today features not just one visionary, but two. The father-son powerhouse duo of Dr. Suhas Patil and of son Dr. DJ Patil. We would like to especially thank Dr. DJ Patil for flying in for the symposium. So thank you very much for making that accommodation. Mm -hmm. Dr. Suhas Patil is the founder of Cirrus Logic, a leading semiconductor company in the US, and is in fact credited with the creation of the fabulous model of the semiconductor industry. He is also the founding president of the Indus Intra Entrepreneurs, the world's largest nonprofit for fostering entrepreneurs. Before becoming an entrepreneur, Dr. Patil earned his master's and PhD in engineering and later electrical engineering from MIT. He then worked in academia, serving as an assistant professor of electrical engineering at MIT and later an assistant professor of computer science at the University of Utah. In 1980, Dr. Patil used his academic work to start Patil Systems, which later became Cirrus Logic. Aside from being an astute scientist and entrepreneur, Dr. Patil is also a Harker parent. Um, his daughter, Teja, his daughter, Dr. Teja Patil, was in the upper school's first inaugurating class, and Dr. Patil was instrumental to Harker's ensuing development. Dr. Patil's son, Dr. DJ Patil, is no less impressive. Apart from co-coining the term data scientist and deeming it the sexy job of the decade, <laughs> Dr. Patil, the younger, has, had, has held roles in academia, industry, and government. As a member of the University of Maryland faculty, Dr. Patil focused his research on nonlinear dynamics and chaos theory. He then held a number of roles at Skype, PayPal, and eBay, and served as the data scientist in residence at Greylock Partners, and the chief scientist, chief security officer, and head of analytics at LinkedIn. Most recently, he was the VP of product at Relate IQ, which was later acquired by Salesforce. In yet another exciting turn in his professional journey, just a few months ago, Dr. Patil was appointed to the positions of Deputy CTO for Data Policy and Chief Data Scientist at the White House by President Obama. Since our speakers are a father-son duo, we thought we'd change up the format a little bit. So now, here we are, dropping into the Patil family's fire room chat, fireside chat. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Suhas and DJ Patil. Great, thank you. Uh, so, you know, in, in, in uh, classic family style, we couldn't figure out who would go first. Uh, so we, we thought we, the only way to do this appropriately is to settle this with a coin toss. So uh, handing off to the third generation, Vaid, do you want to come up here and handle our coin toss for us? All right. Is an impartial harker. That's story. right. Uh, and and you, you promised that your, your grandfather didn't bribe you with ice cream. <laughs> is, is that true? No. <laughs> so I'm going to be toy doing the towing cost. And so <laughs> the Dr. Patil on this side is going to be having tails. And the Dr. Patil on this side, my dad, is going to be ta taking the, the heads. <laughs> I guess it's tails. Tails. <laughs> oh. All right. <laughs> so I get to go first. No ice cream for you. <laughs> That's right. Okay. All right. My first question, DJ, for you is, what do you think I did as a father, you know, that help you develop interest in science or was it your favorite special teacher or maybe you did it all on your own uh you know the the, the part here i think that's a, the most fascinating is how different parts unlocked like the love for science at different times and one of the the classic ones i think that that uh, we used to do together was we had this 501 Radio Shack kit. And we'd play experiments with that. Or we did a lot of stuff that 
uh, was very hands-on in, in the house. Like, I remember one time, some, like, we had to tar the roof to seal up a, the leaking roof. <laughs> and, and, you know, I don't know if that's child labor or if that's, that's punishment or <laughs> it's good science. But the thing which, which was about it is when we were doing these things, we'd always talk about like what was really going on behind it. So, you know, it was like tar. Why, why is the tar a, a, a fluid at one state and why is it a solid in another state? Like what, what is going on there? Why is this unique? Why can't we just put, you know, just rubber cement on this thing? And I think that that's really that part of thinking about the deeper question and, and asking what's the question behind the question? You should always tell me these things of saying, well, Great, you've understood it at this level of sophistication. What would be a richer question to ask? What would be something that's even more nuanced? And you know, I, I remember even like by the time I was in uh, junior high, we were talking about you know uh, the atomic particles, and, and it, it, this was a time when we hadn't really gotten to the subatomic like quarks and those things were super super cutting edge. And realizing that the world doesn't end with a question, it only continuously begins with questions, was something that I got to then take into classes and in, into problems that I was personally interested in and uh, just kept striving after and uh, after. And so I think it, it's this kind of, the takeaway I would have for people is when you see a question, what's, what's the next question? And how do you think about what is that richer kind of question that, that you can, can get to? Was it the teacher or was it you yourself? Uh, well, the teacher was there to help answer the questions and sometimes say that, is that is, maybe the question should be thought about this other way. I think I was very fortunate a lot of times, as, as, as uh, my dad knows and many people have now seen in write-ups, uh, I didn't necessarily have a great high school career. Uh, most often, notably, getting kicked out of my math classes. Uh, but the, the thing that was there was, it, it's a sort of really remarkable thing. So on one side, I was getting kicked out of class by my, by my teachers. And luckily enough, my dad was coming to the rescue and sort of saying, well, why are you kicking him out? What is, what's really going on here? And realizing that the programs weren't as interesting. And on the flip side, I had teachers like the principal who actually suspended me from the school, and my physics teacher who just would give me science equipment and let me take home quant science equipment. So we had these, these pipettes and all these other things that I was allowed to bring home that no other student had access to, and we were replicating experiments that you did in grad school. Uh, uh, you know, Egerton's experiment, the classic one where you see a drop falling and you, can, you have a, uh, that, that kind of classic splash and crown paradigm and, and learning how to take high-speed photography. And so I had a very mixed aspect of how teachers, uh, how teachers interacted with me and how I interacted with them. Uh, but if I wasn't, I think, so passionate about it, there, these other teachers that did come to the rescue, they wouldn't have uh, been able to reach out and, and really uh, uh, find a way to, to, to help me continue my passion. Your turn. Ooh, okay. So, uh, one of the most important pieces of advice you've ever given me, especially as I've job hopped into different things, is, uh, is the idea at those intervals to always ask yourself, what do you want to be in five years, 10 years, 15 years? And then once you have that, it allows you to walk backwards and ask yourselves what to do. That, you know, I've always found that to be one of the pieces of advice I give students all the time. So the first thing is, where did that come from? And maybe you could explain to people why that's so, been so powerful as, as a guidance technique for, for uh, all the people that have wor worked for you, worked with you, and, and your kids. The answer has to do with Typically, we think from where we are and where we are going. That's the linear thinking affected by your circumstances today and your assessment of, you know, short term. So future is projected by series of short term assessments. Okay? 
So I found it very useful to find a mechanism to break out of that. And that is why if you could kind of imagine yourself being five years away or sometimes ten years away and just kind of uh, imagine and relieve yourself from the constraints of today and think backwards. So it's almost like you're, you're five years away and you say, I wish I had done this. I wish I had not done that. Okay? So if you can think like that and then you say, oh gosh, I'm here present today and all those wishes can be granted. So this is a, this is a mental exercise and even though it's all you're doing it, amazingly it allows you to think outside box. So when you were a grad student, did you plan to be an entrepreneur? Was it in your five-year horizon at some point where you were thinking, yeah, maybe I want to be a CEO or I want to be an entrepreneur or I want to be a founder? How did you, like, what was your five-year plan as you were trying to think through, through these things? Well, firstly, you know, I would say, you know, the, the most motivating thing to become an entrepreneur is to, to see someone else successfully become one. So you have a model. Okay? In my case, I grew up in a city called Jamshedpur, which 50 years before I was born was nothing but a jungle. Okay? By the time I was born, you know, it was a big steel plant, you know, houses, school, hospital, everything was built by the, the company which was founded 50 years before. And to me, as a kid, I said, wow, such a thing can be done. It was, that time idea wasn't I would be able to do that, but the possibility existed. The next event for me was when I arrived at MIT, I was so lucky that I was uh, assigned to be teaching assistant to Professor Amar Bose of Bose Speakers. And a, a year before that, he had started this Bose Corporation. So I had to say, oh, professors can be entrepreneurs too. So that I kept in mind. And uh, then, of course, because I had no family background of business, it was a question of what might you know, be needed, what might be possible. Okay? And definitely I was thinking enough that for my minor I took management. Not ever knowing whether such an opportunity would ever arise, but always be aware of it. Okay? So I, at least at that time I didn't say, okay, after my degree I will become an entrepreneur. It was just uh, vigilant observation. In fact, I had an opportunity to become an entrepreneur while I was a graduate student. Okay? Because a company by name Data General was started by my office mate and he says, Swas, why, what are you doing this doctorate for? Just leave. We are starting this company. You come join and you know, we'll make money. <laughs> so I said, but I can't. That sounds like a terrible idea. <laughs> Why would we want to do that? We're academics. <laughs> and I said, listen, I come here uh, you know, to get education, to get my doctorate, and I'm just not going to be swayed by such a thing. I'll finish, then I will see what I can do. Okay. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that you're bringing up there that I think is, is really powerful is that we both also went through this doctorate program, this, this, this idea of, of, of doctorates. Uh, and, and one of the takeaways I've always had when you, you talk about these things is that if you're going to do a doctorate, is this idea that if you start it, you must finish. Uh, and and how, important, how important that, that really is. Uh, 
you know, the same way I, I think of it is, is when you plan backwards in my career, I remember doing this was when uh, I had, uh, just after I'd finished, uh, I'd become a faculty, worked for the Department of Defense, trying to figure out how, to, how uh, Devika, my wife and I could actually be in the same city. And I locked myself in a room for uh, five hours and literally walked through all these planning states of saying, well, what, if it, what does it mean to be a VP of engineering? What does it mean to found a company? What does it mean to, to uh, be a CEO? What, what, what are the things that I, what's the checklist boxes uh, uh, that I have? And so I went through that and it really helped clarify. And then I remember once I actually got a job here in Silicon Valley, one of the most important things happened to me, which was I went and saw a VC and I said, hey, you know what, I've been doing this thing. It seems like you know, I've gotten a little bit of hang of it. I want to be a part of the founding team. And he said, why would I want to put you on the founding team? It's like, you don't, have any, uh, you don't have any star power and the ability to recruit amazing talent. You haven't learned to build and scale uh, technologies and products. You don't materially move the value of the company. And you, don't have, you, you, you haven't figured out how to really navigate the complexity of a product business landscape. And I thought, man, I suck. Uh, uh, but this is, this is like the perfect checklist. So I got to go do all these things on the checklist and then I'll be ready. Uh, and, and it was like, here's the playbook. Uh, and so it, it's sort of one of those things that I always thought is that incredibly powerful lesson of if you can figure out what the playbook is, then all you have to do is start figuring out how to execute on it. All right. It's my turn, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, oh, this one is super important lesson for me. Uh, in building technology, you, you have to say uh, this phrase that has always stuck with me is make sure you're not on the cutting edge, or be on the cutting edge. Make sure you're not on the bleeding edge because on the cutting edge, you get cut. And could you talk a little bit about how to think about that when you're building companies and technology and the kind of the rest of the things that we see here in Silicon Valley, as well as how you think about that in the mindset of, uh, of uh, science. So the difference between cutting edge and bleeding edge, okay? You know, cutting edge means you are, you are pushing the boundaries of where things are today and there is a reasonable chance you know, that uh, after you go up, start doing it, you may figure out how to solve problem, okay? Mm -hmm. Bleeding edge simply means you may have an idea which is really genuinely true, but the rest of the technology or other things just haven't come together to pull it off, okay? And the bleeding edge often results in good ideas being unable to be executed and thus, you know, you, you don't meet with success. I'll give you an example of what was bleeding edge, okay? You all know uh, today's iPhone, right? It's so successful. It started out as Newton, you know, for Apple, okay? There's nothing wrong. Newton was a beautiful concept, but the chips were not there. The power consumption wasn't low enough. Okay? So while they implemented it, it was almost you know, 15 years too early. And they realized it pretty quickly that it was not on a cutting edge but it was on a bleeding edge and they pulled it off and nobody heard about it until you know, they came up with iPhone, which was so successful. Yeah, it's interesting because one of the ones being in academia, you always write these grants that where you need to be bleeding edge. And uh, the, the interesting thing that I've always taken away even there is the research problems that you want to attack also need to have the infrastructure and the other components ready to attack that problem. And uh, being able to, to not just attack a problem once, 
but to keep building on it and keep it gaining momentum on a research problem has been critical. And so finding that balance between bleeding edge, cutting edge, and also uninteresting uh, for broader society has been, has been critical for me. Uh, do we want to, I didn't know how you want to, do we want to do the slide or is, is, are we just taking these questions too? No, no I, I Are you going to ask them? Yeah. Okay. All right. So your, your turn. It's my turn. My oh. turn. Or, okay. I was trying to cut in by just keep asking you questions. You're on to me. <laughs> All right. So, you know, um, as you said, you know, you, you early, uh, early on, you learned from, you know, me and others in asking questions, okay? I know you were a Boy Scout, okay? And Boy Scout, in Boy Scout, you did kind of interesting projects. And one of them, in particular was pretty interesting. It's called Pine Wood Derby, where you get a block of wood, wheels, nails, and you're supposed to build a car and you have to race it, okay? What did you learn by doing? And this example, one of the examples of doing, okay? And how did it sort of help you, you know, with your uh, you know, love for science or just engineering? Uh, so you were a Boy Scout too. So we used yes. to work on these projects together. And, and one of the most important things I think I learned about in Pinewood Derby was the problem and the challenge of scope creep. And uh, to those that don't know scope creep, I mean, all the engineers and everyone here knows what scope creep is. <laughs> it's, a, it's this idea like you're trying to go to a final project and you keep increasing the, the requirements or what you're thinking about the project and before you know it, the project often fails. And, and so the big one for me was scope creep. I remember thinking like, man, we're gonna design this car and it's gonna look beautiful and it's gonna do all these things and you've got like a couple weeks to do this. And so you don't, you can't really even, like how do you get something tangible built and done? Uh, that, that was one of the first ones. The other important lesson was actually a version of the Pinewood Derby that we did, which is uh, the sailboat version where you had to make the sailboat. And uh, I remember being just a, a little headstrong as a youth. And uh, one of the most important lessons that it, it gets summarized in a great statement nowadays, which is design like you're right, listen like you're wrong. And so I remember this moment super clearly. This is when we were living in Utah and there's this, these, you've made these little sailboats and you have to, you have to blow on them to, to, to get them the, the fastest. And I thought I was right and I had done all this great stuff and I, I had figured out everything. And you just looked at, like, everyone's kind of cheering on you. You said, blow at the bottom of the sail. <laughs> That's all you said. And I was like, and I remember thinking, like, ah, oh, gee. And then I thought, okay, listen like you're right. And so I started blowing at the bottom of the sail, and I was like, oh, duh. <laughs> That's where the biggest, that's the biggest portion of the sale. And, and uh, I won the race uh, that way. But it, it has always stuck with me as this important, important rule that you, 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 you approach life, life like you're absolutely right. Approach it and just know that and stick to your convictions, but always listen like you're wrong. Listen to people and all the outside views and take those in and then course correct very, very quickly. And, and if you do that, you're able to really translate that into uh, an actual workable plan. Your turn. My turn. All right. Uh, what was the most important lesson that you had to learn the hard way? Feature creep. <laughs> okay. Before I started uh, Cirrus Logic, okay, I had a spectacular project failure. It was not, I didn't take it, anybody VC's money, okay? But uh, I did take uh, money to do something from my brother-in-law, which is kind of tough. Okay? <laughs> So what, you know, he, he needed something, you know, uh, which was a computer. This is now, you're talking mid, you know, uh, 70s, uh, 1976, 77 time frame. And he, you know, a metallurgist, you know, you wanted something where you pour the metal and it gives you analysis and you wanted a computer, portable one. 
And guess what? I, did, I said, oh, sure. And, and I had a solution. And then he kept on asking me questions. Can this be done? My answer was, of course. Okay. Can it have a display? You know, graphical display? I said, of course. Now, remember, this is now 76, 77. There were no graphic displays in Silicon Valley. But my friend, professor in the University of Illinois, Bitzer, had designed this machine called Play-Doh and had a plasma display. So I called him up and said, could you lend me one? And he sent me one. But bit by bit, because he was curious and he would ask, and I would, of course, the answer was scientific answer, of course. But it added up whereby it became equivalent of building the first laptop in the world just by myself. <laughs> now you could easily look at it today and say, did you have any chance of ever finishing the project in a timely manner? No. Right? So uh, the feature creep, uh, what could have been a very successful gadget I would have built, at that time, it was a Motorola 3600, you know, or some 60, I don't know which chip was, microprocessor of Motorola, it would have done, but it failed. And so I actually returned his money and said, sorry, you know, this thing just too complicated and my mistake I allowed you to do feature creep. Now, that learning was so powerful that when I did start my company, I kept that in mind. Right? It's funny you say, I, I've never heard this story. <laughs> and uh, I remember your cases for the original laptop that I you were building. I still have it. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and it, I remember going into the workshop and sneaking in there. Uh, you can't ground me anymore, so I can tell you all these things. <laughs> but, but it's like we used to sneak in there and like look at this stuff. And then the first time I remember seeing like people coming out with laptops, I was like, oh. Well, of course, aren't, why, why aren't people building these at home? And, and it was sort of this yeah. really kind of uh, interesting thing of like knowing that people, that it was possible many, many years before it actually got developed. Yeah, you know, Grid Computer had a patent for uh, clam, clam Top. I actually had it before Grid Computers. All right, your turn. Okay. And tell us when you want us to switch to these other ones. Okay, I have a question for you, okay? You pretty much grew up in Silicon Valley, you went to school here, okay? Later on, you went to San Diego, you see San Diego for your college, and then East Coast. So, reflecting back, okay, what was so special growing up in Silicon Valley, or did you think it was special? You know, the when I, the Silicon Valley we, I got to grow up in, uh, uh, when we first moved out here, was so radically different. You know, like people think Cupertino, Apple, you know, when Apple was just a few kind of small buildings. Uh, and most of the people went, were support personnel for Moffett Field or uh, Cupertino Electric. That's where Cupertino Electric is really the original stuff. And uh, I went to Monta Vista High School, which uh, at that time had a very also strong vocational school uh, component. And I think the thing that was actually most important for me was learning how to work with your hands. And, and uh, it's something that I, I, I feel like we don't do enough nowadays, is we do a lot of thinking and interacting with computers but we don't do it physically. We don't make things physically. And, that, and that's starting to turn around now with the maker movement, which I, I'm super excited about. But that, that ability where uh, when you know, I, had, I had shop class and I had to, I had to work with, with, with metal, metal works. And including we, cooking and including sewing. Cooking and sewing and, and uh, I can make a mean apron, I can thread the bobbin, I, can, I, I had to learn it all. And, and I thought that the, the notion of really, uh, when you're working, there's something amazing that happens when you've built with conviction and uh, pride. And, and I remember, like, you know, there's kind of the classic what everyone did for regular work, and then 
we did and you showed me how to, to, to really polish the metal and think about the grit of the, uh, the, 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 the powder that you use to, to polish, the polishing powder and the sandstone and everything. Uh, those things is actually what stuck with me mo more than anything relative to technology. And uh, the other component of it is working with people who didn't really work with technology. A lot of uh, uh, families, uh, uh, kids, friends, parents who didn't work with technology has always uh, been, been great for me. And I feel like I'm, I'm very grateful that I grew up in a Silicon Valley that was much more blue collar and uh, has always been incredibly influential into how, how uh, I, I think about the world. You know, what I think you guys learned, at least from my perspective, you saw everybody working hard, okay? And working hard was kind of taken for granted, not only parents of your friends, but all the, all the friends. And uh, so I didn't have to ever t tell you to work hard. You know, you picked it up from Silicon Valley. Yeah, that's, that's actually a really interesting point because the, the, I never thought about it that way, but our parents, like all my friends' parents, like we, we had to, like, I remember we did construction during the summer, we did stuff. We had a, like, there was no easy lunch. Like, they made us really uh, work very, very hard at stuff. Uh, and uh, even mundane things, we had to do it. There was no slacking off. Uh, and that, that's probably created a work ethic. I, mean, I guess you remember my wrestling coach. Like if you cut a corner, uh, you, you, were, you were done for. Uh, and learning that ethic and being able to apply that work ethic to life. I mean, I can tell you right now, life, life, life out of the White House, uh, I am grateful for that work ethic because there is no shortcut for putting in the time and the energy into to critical uh, decisions and policy decisions. Your turn. All right, my turn. Uh, let's see. With that one. You know, there's, there's so much, it's just another Silicon Valley one, which is there's so much tremendous money out there and pressure to be, you know, the, the entrepreneur nowadays. Uh, it's so easy to get just caught up in the money in the Silicon Valley lifestyle. What, what advice would you give to students and other people out there on how to think about the long game versus just the short game of the more recent gratification? Interesting question. Um, you know, I always feel that uh, when you want to go after something that is going to be intense or risky, okay, you want to minimize the risk. And, you know, the entrepreneurship is a interesting where to the outside people, they say, oh, what an entrepreneur, what kind of risk he takes, and all of that sort of bravado kind of things, right? The entrepreneur, on the other hand, is constantly thinking, how can I reduce the risk? And, and he does not even make first move until you know, his or her mind you know, the risk has been reasonably reduced, okay? So, uh, you know, to that extent, uh, being prepared becomes very important in all kinds of ways, okay? The simplest one, you know, is, uh, you know, to acquire as much n knowledge and ability in, in school, in college, now this is controversial. There are famous people who said, you know, college is worthless. You know, uh, you should just I give you a hundred thousand dollars, you start an entrepreneurship. I think that's a absolutely wrong message. Okay. Uh, I would say if you're going to war, would you go there trained or, or send the army trained or just go go just for the heck of it? Okay. So I would say. Education is, you know, very efficient in college. Get as much of it. Now, some, sometimes accidents occur. You know, new technology comes up, and you know, you you it's going to develop slowly. So, 
you jump and do things. But those are exceptions. That is not a way. If you want to be an entrepreneur, there's absolutely 100% you know, ability to become a successful if you, if you follow path. Now, sometimes you get lucky. You know, luck comes knocking only when you're prepared. So that's why I say, just prepared. Let good things happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Okay, we'll start with the audience questions now. So, this is for Dr. DJ Patil. Yahoo calls you an iconoclastic risk taker and a disruptor in the mold of Silicon Valley techies. What do you think about that? Following in my dad's footsteps. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I think it's a, a risk taker. I don't think you necessarily set yourself out to be a risk taker. Uh, uh, I, I think what it is is you, you see the world and you see the inefficiencies and you see the opportunity. And if you look at it and you say, that's like, I remember the number of times I used to look at or seen problems and I go, that is insane. I can't believe that we'd even let the world operate in that way. It is fundamentally unacceptable. Uh, just that notion it forces you to say, to do something about it. And when you decide to do something about it, there's inherent risk involved in it. I've personally viewed the things that I've done actually as rather low risk, uh, but it's not because I'm trying to take a risk. I'm actually trying just to, to work on things that I, I, that I think the world should be in a different way. Okay, uh, next question. Were you humbled or enlightened about anything when you were rejected from colleges and had to go to community college? Do you have advice for any students here regarding, regarding handling rejection? Uh, you know, I think the rejection actually, the part that's most interesting to me about rejection was uh, not the fact that I was rejected, but actually, uh, actually how uh, my dad would see me. Uh, and uh, you know, there's, there's something that we always grew up with was uh, we're never really punished. Uh, it was more of a notion of disappointment, and, and disappointment is a much harsher form of any punishment that you, you can have. And so knowing that you, you, you failed uh, your parents, but also as a result, like when you don't fail your parents, you, you actually fail yourself in the eyes of your parents. And that was actually much, much more tough for me to accept. Uh, my general view with re rejection is uh, it's always a great uh, process in humility. And the thing that is that I would encourage everyone to do when you're rejected is you can cry, you can, you can be angry, you can, you can do whatever you need to do for a day. That's it. You get one day to do it. And then everything else is what now what? What are you going to do next? What is the plan? What are you going to do? And, and I've been fortunate enough to have a, 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 you know, a great collaborator with my dad in this of when it was rejected, it was like, well, why not appeal? And I was like, why not appeal? <laughs> Who, they, like, sure, but everyone else takes rejection as a steadfast, like you're done. And it's like, well, yeah, okay, maybe, maybe it is possible to appeal, maybe we should do that. And then there's a question of how do you do it? How do you go about that? Uh, and, and I think that that's something that you, you need a great set of people around you constantly working with you to, to push you. And, and my dad was never one to say like, oh, great, well, now we're going to disown you because you couldn't get into college. Uh, in fact, it was like, great, now, now what? I don't know, does that marry up with your... Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Okay. Uh, no, for... I, I will add one okay. thing more. Okay. Um, there's another thing that's very important. I think you, you, you have it now. You know, uh, you know things, ha things happen and you know, you're trying to do something, it doesn't work out. Okay? At that time, you know, if you can keep cool enough, 
uh, you know, so that you know your mental faculty works. Okay, it's amazing. You know, you come up with alternatives. You know, come up with a plan. You know, if it consumes you, okay, then you're just done. And I, I, had, I have a very good example. I, I used to participate in you know, schools exhibition like this. And I was going to build a model submarine. You know, uh, I had seen this, you know, whatever, so many leagues under the sea and you know, how impressive the submarine was. So I was going to build everything, starting from the motor to the you know, have battery, sophisticated one. And the date was approaching, and one week before, I admitted to myself, this project won't finish. <laughs> and then I said, now what am I going to do? So I went back to drawing board and came up with a totally you know, new idea and concocted it with uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, Little boxes, just like a medicine, you know, uh, equipment and uh, water and and a pump uh, to push the water, air in and propel the water. And in the end, all the things I was trying to to show, including Newton's laws and the buoyancy principles and all of that, was neatly. And captured it, and I did this thing in one week. As it turns out, that won the grand prize of the whole thing. So I, it it then dawned on me that keeping cool when things fall apart is the secret to survival. Mm -hmm. and that's yeah. that's what he did actually. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's not just that. I think one of the things that, that what people don't may not know is, so my grandfather, your dad, uh, he started a company in his 70s, like the, the whole fonts he was designing. Like when you see all these fonts, and especially those uh, that are of South Asian uh, descent, like all of Devnagari and all these things, he designed that. You just did a, like your most recent startup last year. Uh, so, so there's like... Rejection and failure and iteration never ends uh, uh, because you're constantly, constantly trying and doing new things if, if, if you're trying to change the world. Okay. The term data science is everywhere these days. What are the opportunities in this field? Are there any pitfalls to the potential over-reliance on computers and models? Uh, one of the things people don't realize where I, I, a lot of these ideas around data science come from actually come from uh, both my father and uncle, both who were at, at, at MIT. And I got to see through them what happened with AI uh, in the, the, the 70s, late 70s, 80s, and how the overhype happened and the collapse and all these things. And, and uh, one of the premises of that is like, wait, now, that was, that was bleeding edge back then. In the current generation, this is now cutting edge. It's very doable. It has real applications. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that what happened at LinkedIn was we had this problem of, of how did these Hadoop jobs uh, that kept failing and over and over again. And I remember talking to my dad, and he'd given me one of these, these talks very early on in, uh, I think, maybe high school, junior high, about schedulers. And I remember going to him and saying, hey, remember those scheduler things that you told me about? Tell me a little bit more about it. Because you built the first time, time scheduler? Is it the first one or the, somewhere? It may not be fair, but it was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> so a good one. And that became uh, what's, what's known as Oscobon for anybody that's in the data science field is one of the, 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 the really popular uh, schedulers out there. But we didn't have those ideas unless, it's not like we came up with this stuff. We reinvented this stuff. We're building on top, standing on top of the shoulders of the greats that have done this before. And now we're taking what was bleeding edge and putting it in the cutting edge. And now the next generation, what they're gonna do is how to take that and turn that into additional application and products. And the, one of the most important things in there is for, that we can do in this generation is set up the ethical frameworks for what will come up. To the efforts that, and I know Harker does this with a bunch of the ethics training programs I've been super impressed with, is that ethical framework, that legal framework, the societal framework, the legal frameworks 
all of how we think about what do we think is acceptable, what do we want it to be, how do we drive to that, that's what we can put in place for the next generation to take advantage of these things to make sure that we are building in a responsible way that keeps on benefiting the entire world and not just small narrow slices of one population of one country but the entire world. Okay. Uh, Dr. DJ Patil, explain a little bit about your job in the White House. Uh, so this is the first time we have this job, so uh, we get to define it as we go, and if we do a good job, there'll be a second one. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, people say, what's your measure of success? It's pretty easy. <laughs> there'll be somebody else. The, the, uh, in all seriousness, the, the, this came out of a number of conversations with uh, uh, the administration about how should we think what, what, what is the opportunity with data? And what is the power that can happen? And so the mission statement for the, the uh, Chief Data Office of the Chief Data Scientist is to responsibly unlock and unleash the power of data for the betterment of American uh, citizens uh, and their well-being. So the first initiative of that is what we call Precision Medicine Initiative. And this is the idea that we have the genome. It's an amazing data set. Everyone now can get it sequenced. It's still relatively expensive, but the price is coming down. So great, we have that information. How do we combine that with modern data science techniques, statistics, bioinformatics, all of this, and start actually making clinical decisions with it? If you have a, 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 a drug, and my dad has a drug and I have a drug, and because we're genetically similar, we probably wouldn't have this difference. But let's suppose that he metabolizes it at twice the rate I do. Well, there's no way right now for that to be put into the system so that when you get your drug at your local pharmacy, that that's going to be really registered. It's not, it's not easy. It takes real work. So how do we bring all that together to start creating this next wave of evolution and iteration in the medical space. That's one component. Another one is open data, my data efforts, the ability to be able to take this data, really unlock it for you to get to build on top of it. The best example of this is the National Weather Service. All of you are probably open up your phone, look at an icon, but behind that icon is 21 terabytes of data being generated a day just for that particular forecast. Satellites, ships, planes, amazing billions of dollars of infrastructure supporting that to create an icon. But that icon materially changes the way you interact with the world in the existing way you think about things. It impacts everything from crops all the way through to, to, to you know, national security. Think Katrina and hurricanes and other type things. So being on top of that is critical and how do we empower that? And one of the ones that I'm now very excited about is how do we take data and start using that to have a conversation about policing, community policing, and as well, how do we start thinking about how data is used responsibly in the areas of things like data discrimination? How do we make sure that data is being used to empower rather than disenfranchise particular groups of people? And there's a whole long list of other things, but uh, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay. Uh, for Dr. Patel Sr., has your son taught you anything? <laughs> Ouch! Always! <laughs> the kids, kids teach you much, you know? Um, it, it, interestingly, um, I watched with Marvel his journey. Okay? His journey, you know, way, you know, he started in college as a political scientist to become a political scientist, okay? then a computer scientist, then a physicist, and then finally a mathematician. Okay? And uh, you know, the, out of that came, you, know, you can become a mathematician. And I had asked him, what are you, what are you gonna do okay? uh, after becoming a mathematician? You, know, you, you can go teach, okay? Or if you don't want to teach, then you will maybe need 10 years to define what you want to work on, okay? And that journey of from there to helping Department of Defense, then you know, eBay and so on, it's kind of taught me 
that uh, you know a real example of how Silicon Valley is going to be. You know, namely, our young people will need to get uh, trained, or they must train themselves to be very agile with respect to what they work on. Okay, uh, the future workforce in Silicon Valley, every individual will work for more than one entity. Maybe they will work as an independent. And there will never be a dull moment. And you will be constantly redefining. Okay? Now this, instead of being theoretical, I actually see in my son. So to that extent, you know, I have learned a lot. OK. Um, Dr. Patel Jr. How do you think your cavalier attitude towards academics in high school has impacted you? Cavalier. <laughs> good choice of words. I, I think it's actually a really good choice of words, is, is, is uh, cavalier. Uh, I think the most, what, the most important rule that I did learn in high school was that there, there are, uh, there's no such thing as a rule. Uh, they're all guidelines. And, and certain of those guidelines are, make sense. And uh, they're, they're there for good reason. Uh, to protect you is, a, is an obvious one. There's, a, there's, there's things that you can get yourself into trouble, or you can get others into trouble. So, so those, those are good guidelines. The, there, and there's a lot of rules that make no sense whatsoever. And those should be actively broken. And, and I, I think there's... <laughs> Like, and I, th I think there's like you know the, the cool thing is like you can look at these and you're just like that's stupid and then you say why is that rule there and it's like is that rule there because it's trying to impede somebody or is it just an edge case that somebody made up because somebody did something and now everyone else is penalized and so a lot of I felt what I, I, I had that like one of the ones was for me was assignment sheets I thought that's what a waste of time it's like it's like filling in an assignment seat so it looks nice. Like, what are we supposed to take away from that? That we're that we're really good at doing something. Uh, one of the ones I got in super in trouble for was just as optical character recognition had started coming up, like you know the computers being able to detect text. So we had this chemistry teacher, and he used to make sure they like we'd have to type up our lab notebook things all the time. And I just thought this is a phenomenal, colossal waste of time. And so I I, I snuck into the lab because uh, we weren't supposed to use the lab for the scanner. You know, easily was able to bypass that, and I would scan the, uh, uh, all the lab books. And then I would just change a few words here and there so he, I wouldn't get totally busted for plagiarism. And, and I thought it was, just a, it was just incredibly stupid, because I was like, why, why are you making us spend an hour just typing this up? Like, what, what's the benefit of it? Well, are we supposed to make sure that we know the protocol? Absolutely. That's important because somebody could get hurt and we're trying to actually accomplish the success of an experiment. But the mechanism was wasting students' time versus spending that very valuable time learning. And so that was something that I got actively challenged on and a lot of trouble for. <laughs> but it was something that I felt was, it, it was, there was no good use for it. And so to people out there, which probably is not, will get me in trouble with my own kids possibly here, <laughs> is, you should, challenge, you should challenge things that you don't think are appropriate. But don't challenge them in a, in, a, in a way that is just there to be grandstanding. You do it in a conversation with good dialogue. Uh, and that was something I didn't, I didn't fully appreciate. The ability to engage in good dialogue and challenge things through a discussion is, is substantially more important than just trying to be just, just trying to throw something in somebody's face by doing it uh, in, in another way. And, that's and why you got thrown out of the That's why I got thrown out. Class. That's right. And, <laughs> and once I got and figured, figured that out, uh, uh, I spent my, my entire time in academia uh, really focusing on that, uh, those, those things. Even at the, the, the at, at University of Maryland, where I eventually became faculty, was really spent times of getting rid of stupid things. And, and I think you could argue that uh, the way I look at my time in the White House is similarly such as looking at things that are inefficiencies in our public good. Now, there's a lot of good reason why things are a certain way, but there's also a tremendous amount of things that we have to fix. We must fix these things, not just because of, of what is critical for the, our, our country, 
but because they are the morally the right things to do. And when we get, decide what we are on the side of what is morally right and responsible, we will always choose correctly for the broadest portion of society. Okay, I think we're out of time. So just really quickly, one question that's been super popular for some reason. Um, Dr. DJ Patel, do you really have a Pikachu in your office? <laughs> this has been by far our most popular question. Uh, there is a Pikachu in the office. <laughs> it, it is not my Pikachu, however. It is actually Megan's Pikachu. Megan, so, so uh, the, the, all of us, you know, you normally think of Washington, these super fancy offices. Uh, we ripped out all of the fancy and just put in as many desks as we can so we have a bullpen. So Megan, who's uh, the CTO, she sits right next to me. Alex, who's one of the other deputy CTOs, sits uh, um, just opposite of me. Uh, and so we're all very much in a crammed environment. Uh, it's Megan's uh, Pikachu, and, and uh, 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 it is true it is my skateboard, however, that is in the office, and, and it is true that I, I do skateboard to work. And I... I also did eat it the other day in front of the Secret Service on the skateboard. <laughs> uh, but uh, it is true we also have a small medical hospital in the White House to, to help fix you up. So it is, uh, <laughs> the, 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 we, we, we have a lot of fun uh, uh, in the White House versus uh, a lot of the stodgy way people don't normally look at the office. Okay, thank you. Thank both of you so much for coming here today. Thank and you. Speaking. You're welcome.